busted. Ebony Hustle. Hey everybody, it's the one and only Brooklyn. Yes, welcome to Brooklyn's Tea Talk. No tea, no shade, just some pink lemonade. So um, I want to get to know you just like everybody else. Um, all my followers and things of that nature want to get to know you because I heard a little bit about you, but this is your time for us to know more about you, about what you do, how you got involved in a lot of things, what made you decide to go um, a certain route. So we're going to start off first um, with the the journal, the Chicago Journal had mentioned you as top 20 entrepreneur to look out for two, for 2020. Um, what do you think made them notice you as an individual? So I think, you know, obviously I'm, I'm originally from Chicago, although I live in, um, in Texas, uh, I'm originally from Chicago. I'm a very uh, focused and driven person. You know, um, I like to try to understand how things work. And so I spend a lot of time researching before I make moves, you know, to, to do things. So I think a lot of it is about my career, the different things I've intersected with from entertainment to music to film and television. I think the ability to uh, merge those worlds together and create content that people actually want to see. Absolutely. So you said you, um, so where did you start off first? What was your, what was your first passion before you actually excelled and went to <laughs> other avenues? So my story is a little different because I, uh, I was a pre-med major. I wanted to be a doctor. Ooh. I wasn't trying to be a, a filmmaker. Um, I'll give you the cliff note version of, of the story. When I was in college uh, trying to f figure out, you know, what medical school I was going to go to, this uh, production manager called me and said I had left a message on an answer machine saying that I wanted to work on this uh, independent movie. And I was like, no, I didn't. She's like, yes, you did. And I was like, I didn't remember doing it. I, I, obviously, I, I, sh I had done it at some moment. And at the time, I was a manager at a parking garage. I had just lost my job. Mm -hmm. so I was in college. And so I always liked movies and entertainment. And so I figured, well, I'm not doing anything. You know, why not go and see what they're talking about? So I went in, it was for a second assistant directors on an indie film. So I went in and talked to the first assistant director. I had like the suit and tie on. I'm all dressed up to go to this interview. And about five minutes into it, he realized I couldn't help him do nothing because I didn't know nothing about film production. But he liked me. So the production manager calls back and says, um, I can't hire you for that position but I have a production assistant in the art department, which you'd be interested because the guy they hired, he was from Canada and he didn't have a valid driver's license. And truth be told, my license was suspended at the time, but I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, they were like working 16 days a week, six days, uh, six weeks, six days straight. Uh, and the pay was like $50 a week. And I said, yes, I said, I, I'm, 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 I'm all in, I want to do this. Ironically enough, this is the way the universe works. The movie is called Scenes for the Soul. It was directed George Tillman's first film out of film school. George went on to do Soul Food, Men of Honor, uh, all the barbershop movies. He's, he's done some really big movies, but this is his first film out of film school. I, I didn't know him from anybody else. I was just, you know, responding to something, obviously, and, and wanted to work on it. At the time, after we uh, worked on that movie, there was another guy I met who worked on the movie, too. Uh, who went to this community. He didn't go to film school either. He went to community workshop for a filmmaker, for directing particularly. And during that time, when people wanted to get music videos, they either went to New York or LA. There was nobody in the middle of America doing that. There's nobody in Ohio or, you know, Indiana or somewhere. It was only in the, on the coast. So, but people wanted music videos. They would spend a lot of money, like twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for, uh, for music videos for songs who weren't even radio. You know, mind you, I everything is digitized now, but I come from, my filmmaking experience come from actually from physical filmmaking with film cameras, with film we had to get developed and processed. So it wasn't so much of a, hey, let's just pick a camera and do it. It was a really process of it. So I come from really the process and the respect of, you know, the filmmaking process. So we started doing music videos uh, uh, there in, in Chicago. Uh, one of the video, couple of videos we did for this producer named Steve Hurley. Steve Hurley has worked with everybody from Madonna to Michael Jackson. He's uh, he's a big house producer in Europe, and you know, he's a big remix producer here in America. Where people are doing a lot of remixes, and uh, he he had this deal. He had this management company he had just set up. He had this artist he was managing. He was managed uh, Shante Savage at the time, and uh, he was doing a lot of production for CC Peniston. 
And he <clears throat> wanted to start this production company. And he was like, hey, why don't you come and work with me as a publicist? And I'm like, Steve, I don't know if I can do that. And he said, I think you can do it. I said, okay, fine. I ended up staying three years and ultimately become the director of international ANR for his uh, label. I set up offices for him and agents in the UK and in Japan. You know, so it was a matter of just kind of, you know, someone saw something in me, they gave me an opportunity and I just kind of ran with it. You know, once this uh, kind of deal was over with me and I went back to, you know, to production, during the time where I was, you know, working at the label, I knew all the people who worked at the, the big labels and even the small labels. I knew everybody. So music videos, I've done about 200 music videos in my career. Music videos are not, in a lot of cases, not about how great a music video director you are from a business standpoint. It's about, do I trust you with giving you this money and this song to come back with something that I can um, use? Record labels, uh, streaming services, networks, although they traffic in uh, creativity, they're corporate entities. So these people are not trying to do anything that's going to mess up their job, their PTO, and their 401k. So they got to show they bought something at the end of the week and say, hey, I just spent all this money. Is this something viable? So because I knew everybody who worked at the labels when I went back to doing music videos and eventually commercials, um, they, I was able to get them to trust me to, you know, to do a lot of the stuff. That's so good. So when you... You you said to you you spoke about soul food, which is big. I love that movie, and um, you also so, um, spoke about producing and and directing. So if you had to choose, which one do you do you find yourself more grav do you more gravitate to? Is it more producing or is it more directing or is it a, a combination of both? So uh, the, the be it, let's just kind of talk about what it means to be uh, a because I'm a director, writer, and a producer. So let's talk about what it means to be a director and let's talk about what it means to be a writer. So a writer has these ideas in their mind of the visions and ideas they come up with and they get it out on a piece of paper. They go to a director and say, hey, do you understand my vision and what I'm trying to do? And the director's like, yes, I can see this clearly. The producer is the person saying, yes, I understand what you're trying to do, but here's your, your restraints of what you can do. This is the person who taps down. I, I, I find myself being a pretty good mix of all of them, being the creator and being creative and also being a business person. But I found a lot of joy in being a producer, not just for myself, but also opportunities for a lot of young people. Uh, a couple of years ago, I should say a little bit more than a couple of years ago, I was in Atlanta doing this press junket for this movie I, I worked on. And, you know, you go to the press junket, they ask you all these questions and stuff like that. And so young people come to me all the time and ask me, you know, how can I get in business? And usually I, you know, I give them some response. But this particular day, I told this young guy, young black guy, I told him, um, you have something very powerful I didn't have when, you, when, you, when I was growing up. You have Google. If you ask Google the right question, you'll get the right answer. So he stopped and he looked at me. He said, you know what, John? I don't even know what the right question to ask. And so that made me start thinking that there are a lot of young guys and women who understand production to a point that actually produce music videos or commercials and everything, but they really don't understand the aspect of how to move to the next level. They don't understand what it takes to the business aspect of what you need to do to do that. So I started uh, looking for young guys. One, because I realized that I can't direct everything. I, <laughs> I, I cannot, but I can produce multiple things at one time. So I started looking for young, young people who have the ability to really make some stuff happen they were creative but he just didn't understand the business acumen and so um the last move i did uh ebony hustle i provided an opportunity for this young guy that i met in chicago i was working i was directing an episode of this international tv series and he was one of the camera guys and so we kind of befriended kind of you know over the years we kind of talked to each other so when i had an opportunity to to uh, produce this film i was looking for a director he was the one i gave the opportunity so this is that was his first feature he had done lots of music videos and other stuff but it was this opportunity to do that so i love directing and, and writing because it gave me an opportunity to have creative outlets but producing i find the best joy in because i can help other people outside of myself that's Thanks for the breakdown. I did. I really didn't think about it on on that type of scale, but when you break it down like that, it makes it makes more sense. It really does. So, could you tell us um, how you got to connect with um, P 
people um, with movies like Soul Food and Man of Man of Honor and things like that? Like, how did you become uh, involved with things like well, that? In that particular aspect, um, with the thing with, with George Title, it, it was just because I, I happened to answer an uh, ad that I must have saw somewhere and left a message on the answer machine, you know. So after we did uh, Scenes for the Soul, he did move scenes for the soul, although it's never been seen before, because after he sold it, he sold it to Doug McHenry's company. And like a week later, they went out of business. So the movie has never actually been seen before. You know, if you mm -hmm. go look on his list of credentials, you'll see the movie, but it's, it has never been released before. So once I worked with him on that, I worked on some other things too. And then I eventually went, the guy that I met, we went to uh, go and start doing music videos. So my, my path crossed, the universe allowed us to cross to meet other people for, you know, for me to move on with my career. Yes, and I can see that because my next question goes, you have also worked with people um, that have, that are living legends, such as Michael Jackson, Prince, Madonna. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And, and how did you feel the first time meeting Mr. Michael Jackson or Prince or Madonna, your feelings? So working for Steve Hurley allowed me to meet a lot of people. A lot of times, in those kind of environment, I don't necessarily get to interact with those people. It's, it's Steve, you know, I'm probably, you know, being a publicist and doing a and &R, I'm the person behind the scenes to so kind of make things happen. You know, all those are big names that he's worked with, but he's worked with a lot of tons of other people too. So my position in that is pretty much just facilitating more business aspect things to it. I did meet, you know, so obviously some famous people, um, the Michael Jackson and Prince thing, that's very guarded. So that was really pretty much just Steve. <laughs> doing that you know uh interjecting it, myself into it was just kind of a small part into the biggest scheme of things okay so you never actually oh i was gonna say you actually i was no, i actually got I, I met some really famous people but when you get like big like that you know you a lot of time access to them is very limited you know they don't you know they're not like let's jump on the call or zoom they don't they don't do that you know so they have people like when you get to the part where you actually have to physically talk about doing something that you definitely have to do with it. It's either in, in person or you have a brief telephone call and then they kind of talk about what they're gonna do. Then he he's in his studio and he does what he's supposed to do or whatever he's gonna do with them. There's not a lot, you would think it would be a whole bunch, but when you get that big, it's not a whole bunch interaction that you have with the other person. Okay, so my next question is, you also have a history and music business. What are some of your credentials in this in industry? When it comes well, outside, to the music. Well, outside, outside of, of the music videos. Outside of being a publicist uh, for a, a music production company and then ultimately being director of international a r for a management company, I've been the label president twice. You know, so I've managed artists, I've managed uh, careers of producers. I've done a significant amount of that. I don't do a lot of that now only because I realize in, uh, especially in music and, and my patience is just not. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> yeah, not what it used to I'm be. Being, <laughs> I'm being honest. My patience is the babysitting of that sometimes. It's just not something that where I'm at this moment. When I was younger, going on tour, being on a tour bus, it's like, oh, wow. But as you get older, I'm just not interested in, 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 in doing all that. How, I, how? I will manage other people's labels and aspects of I'll do the business acumen of it, but I won't be there as they're in a studio and they're on tour to want to do that so I don't have to necessarily do that did you have a bad experience or is it something that you did and you say you know what this is just not for me well it's, it's you know I'm 51 you know and, and, and I have other responsibilities things that I have to be concerned with when you're going tour and you that physical going from city to city sleeping on the bus and everything that is very tiresome Anybody who does that uh, now, it takes to do that over a period of time, you know, and I'm not a performer, you know, I, you know, I don't write songs or rap or any of those type of things. So the business part of it, although sometimes I do have to go depending on what the event is, but for the most part, what I can do, just because we live in a technology society, I can do everything I can from the computer. I really don't necessarily need to physically be there to do a lot of things, you know. So I wouldn't say necessarily it's a bad experience, but it's just um, I pay my dues and I don't have to do that. 
anymore. Absolutely. And you look good for 51, by the way. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. So I know everybody's been talking about it. We spoke about it. I gave my thoughts about it. How did you feel about the incident that happened with um, Mr. Chris Rock and Will Smith? Is that like, I know a lot of people had mixed feelings about it. So how would you react in a situation like that? So, yes, people have been talking about it. Uh, for some way in the back of my mind, I figured he was going to ask you this question. Uh, <laughs> I, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, uh, first of all, I'm going to say this. Will Smith, on the basic level, before we get into anything else, he loves that woman. And any pain, because he was okay with it, the ha-ha and kiki when I was laughing, but when she had the look on her face of hurt or some type of disgust, he felt compelled as the man that loves this woman that he needed to do something about it. And this wasn't the first time Chris Rock had said something derogatory. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you really don't know what people are going through, especially celebrities you have. No, they're just regular people too. And so at that moment, I feel like he could have dealt with it differently. I would have approach it a little bit differently but at that moment just being a guy from west philly he was like you're not gonna keep talking about my woman and he felt like he needed to do something about that you know if we were like in just regular world and somebody was doing that and they did that people would be outraged by it, but they would understand they wouldn't you know make such a big thing but because will smith is he has to remember he's an icon and that whatever he does is, you know, represents not just him, but the people who, who are underneath him. So now Sony has put Bad Boys 4, 4 on the back hole, Netflix, a movie's doing that. It's just not him. It's, Will Smith can go away tomorrow with all the money he got and just disappear and we'll never see him again and he'll be okay. With all those people who's working on those projects, now they won't be able to work. And that was a part of them working. So when you get in those situations, a lot of responsibility. And so you have to think not just about your, yourself at that moment, you got to think about what the repercussions are, what are those things that's going to happen if I, if I do this? And he was just, in that moment, I feel you, protecting my woman. She said, somebody said something direct to her about it, but now you have to deal with the, the repercussions of that. And it's not just you, it's other people that you have to deal with, you know? And so I think that there could have been a way of dealing with, dealing, dealing with the whole situation It might, might have been better but it has happened now. And so now he has to deal with those repercussions, not just for himself, but for other people too. Absolutely. I just feel like in the heat of the moment, like you said, it was ha ha ki ki. But, and I, I said it on, when I spoke about it on Brooklyn Sea Talk, I basically said, um, outside of filming and stuff like that, they're actually friends. Like these guys are actually friends. So Will could have expressed something to Chris Rock about Jada or about whatever's going on in their personal life outside of film and all the Hollywood stuff, he could have reached out to Chris or whatever. And, you know, they could have had a hard time about how his woman is feeling about being, having alopecia, all that type of stuff. He could have expressed himself to you. And then now you're basically taking that and throwing it in my face. This is not the first or the second time you have spoken on my wife in a negative way or my family. So it's like, how much, yes, you are my friend, but how much can you really take from your friend? Like how much times are you gonna to continue to poke me? And in the public eye, behind closed doors, you act like me and you are the best of friends, but in the public eye, you're a totally different person. So at the end of the day, I think it was just one, in that moment, he was just showing him like, we are friends, but I'm gonna let you know, like outside, you're not about to speak about my wife about that, like, like that. Cause like you said, at the end of the day, that's his wife, regardless of what anybody wants to say, that's his wife at the end of the day. He's laying with her. So if he had to go home and we don't know what Jada would have did at home if he if he didn't react, if what it would have been, he probably would have had to sleep on the couch in the guest house. We don't know what, what could have went on. But Will obviously knows what would have happened. That's why he reacted in the moment. You get what I mean? Because remember, with August, he didn't say anything. August, is saying, he never really came out publicly with- well, The, the this, thing with, with him in August, this is the thing about it, is that, you have to remember too, when people get married, especially if they, they're together for a long period of time, or I use the sample of Whitney and Bobby. People always try to say like Bobby Brown messed up Whitney Houston and he brought all these things to her. Let me tell you something. As a, as a man who was married, I'm divorced now, a man who's married. 
you don't marry people and stay for that period of time when y'all are not kind of like on the same page. Y'all not doing the same stuff. You know, if you doing something, they doing it. You know, they, that's just the way it works. So Whitney Houston was already messed up before Bobby Brown came. Not and surprised. The reason why they work together because they was doing some of the same stuff. It worked. So when it comes to uh, Will and his wife, they probably they already said they had an open relationship and that you, you don't have to go too far on that. You understand what that is. It was only because the guy got upset because she was kind of like, yeah, I've been there, done that. I want to move on to something else. He was hurt by it. So his feelings got to play. So now you got to tell everybody. So you got to think in the biggest scheme thing, this wasn't the first person that she didn't been with. Ain't the first person he didn't been with outside their relationship. It's just that this is the first person who vocal about it. This yeah. person, you know, usually they kind of pay people off with certain things and probably like, I, I'm going to hook you up with this. Just, you know, be cool. Just keep it in our space. This man was hurt. something absolutely it's like yeah. it's like you know that's why beyonce says man if you want to sit with me you have to sign a non-disclosure she makes it very clear like certain situations she probably looks at it like the status that you're at when you when you're at a certain like there's certain things that shouldn't be said and i get it but august definitely wanted that to come out so so speaking of hollywood like since we're on the topic of Oscars and stuff like that. What are your thoughts on Hollywood? Like, do you do you feel like people do tend to? It's true when people say they get caught up in the fame and Hollywood changes people and things. You you feel like that that that's kind of true, or it all depends on the person. I think that I don't think anything or a place can change anybody. I think of whoever you are, it's already inside of you. So if you tomorrow, if you if you are um, cheap. And you win the lottery tomorrow, you're just going to be a person with a lot of money that's cheap. I mean, it, it's not going to change. It's not going to change. <laughs> you know, if you are an overly generous person and you get an opportunity to help people, you're going to overly extend yourself. I don't think, I think with money and opportunity just exaggerate who you are. It doesn't really change a lot. So people like say, oh, you didn't got Brandon. No, it was always that way. It's almost like you, you see, just going back to relationships, you're with somebody, you've been married to somebody for 20 years. And you with each other because it's financially benefit for you all to be together for whatever particular reason with the kids and everything. And it's probably gonna cost you more to get rid of that person. But if you hit a lick, if you make some money, peace. You know? so. Yeah, so Bye. that's just the reality situation. People are with people in situations based off of what the economic outlook is. So you go to Hollywood and you blow up, then you know you the same person you always been. Now you just got money and a little clout you know, to do it. True. So could you tell us about, um, could you tell us about Ebony Hustle and what it's, the people that are involved in it and what it's about a little bit? So Ebony Hustle is about an extra returns private investigator. Uh, what Ebony does on a day-to-day -day basis is that she uh, it does insurance fraud and workers' comp cases. So people have those kind of cases, they come to her and say, hey, can you verify that this person actually needs to get this claim? So the insurance says around, she goes and watches people. On this particular day, a woman from the uh, neighborhood sees her, you know, spying on somebody and said, I need your help. Her 16-year-old daughter goes to this concert to see this guy named Caleb Truth. Caleb, he is like a mix between R. Kelly and Kanye West. So he got like, he like young girls, but he got a God complex. Not a good combination. But uh, she went to this concert three months ago with a friend and she never came back. And so Ebony's like, look, I don't do missing kids. And she's like, I try to go to the police, but because he's so famous, they're not really paying attention to me. I need you to go and get my daughter. So through a series of events, she, re she realizes she, she's going to help this uh, woman and she goes to try to get her daughter back. How did you come up with that concept? Like, uh, seriously. You know I'm going to tell you something. Um, a distributor approached me, with, you know, I, I work with a couple of distributors. A distributor approached me about working on a project. And they had this idea that they wanted to do a movie about a cougar. There's one thing I did mention, I, I failed to mention about Ebony. And it's like every great superhero is that she likes young guys. 
like and so whenever she's focused on a case and she's focused on this young boy, something always kind of trips her up because she's too focused. She's just distracted. Like, like ghost. Yeah. She did. Yeah. So uh, they come to me and they said they want to do a movie on a cougar. They want to kind of do like a new kind of Pam Grimm black exploitation thing. And being a black filmmaker, I didn't want to do a black exploitation movie, but I tried to find a way that we could find a middle ground and knew what that would look like today. What would that Pam Grimm look like? A empowering woman. So we came up with the idea of her being a stripper. She's an ex-stripper. She never had a pimp or anything like that. So she's an empowered woman who knows what she wants. She knows the direction she's going into and she's not letting anybody tell her. So throughout the movie, you see her friends say, well, we're not as strong as she's like, you are, you can do this. So it's about a woman who understands her worth and she understands the power that she possesses inside and really goes out to make things happen for herself. I love that because I'm all about women empowerment. So just hearing that and you know, I I have a good amount of stripper friends. So even things like that just brings me to my friends and the ups and downs that they have to go through and, and stuff like that. And to have a woman that has a background like that and is still able to be in the forefront and turning to other females and saying, you know what, don't say that. You can do it. Yeah, that's that's I I like stuff like that. I really do. So um you also have the red all over film out right now. What is the story behind the creation of this movie? So Red All Over is about gun violence. You know, uh, a lot of times when you have the story of gun violence, it like let's say somebody shot somebody, people get on TV and they kind of demonize the person who shot, but most young people don't get up in the morning and decide they're going to shoot somebody. It's just not something that they normally do. There's a story behind it. How you get the gun? How did you get in the place? And so we try to tell both sides of the spectrum about how he got the gun, why he had the gun. And also from the young girl who actually gets shot, why was she at that place? You know, what was the obstacles in her life and what, where she was at when this all happened? So. The movie, you make a decision about, you know, how you feel about it. But you can always go into it with an educated idea of seeing the story of what the boy went through and the girl who got shot. Now you got both sides of the story. Maybe it'll make you think a little bit, you know, more about how to uh, perceive that, you know, idea of gun violence. That's uh, that's crazy because I'm I I just got hired to be a VDW, which is a violence disruptor. That and resources that will help the young men and women. Um, to, to help stop the gun violence and things of that nature. And we're actually, I'm actually going through training and stuff like that. So I think a movie like this um, would be excellent for me to bring up at the next meeting for all of us as a collective to um, look at, because not only me, but the other young man that I'm working with, just to see like how you said you're breaking it down from, from both sides of the spectrum um, and understanding where people are coming from and why they, they got to, um, to that place where they felt like they needed to pick up a gun I think that movie I think your film would be excellent for our next meeting so I'll definitely bring that up is it online where where can yeah, I find that can, it's streaming now on Peacock you can look at it on Peacock you can, you can see it on Amazon to be pretty much I have Amazon on uh, most uh, platforms you just go to Google and type it red all over uh, okay I'll let I'll let them know for the next meeting because we're on um, yeah that that was a big issue that we were speaking about um because they don't they got us based off of what we know, our knowledge in the streets, what we have been through in the streets and stuff like that. But how can I put it? People that are sitting across from you that haven't lived that life or understand it or even been around it don't understand when we're speaking to them and saying, yo, it's bigger than just the gun violence. Like mm -hmm. you guys have to understand the past and where it came from. Some of these situations happen from kids taking on beefs from their brothers or their uncles or their dads or whatever it may be. They don't, like you said, they just don't pick up a gun in the morning and say, Hey, I'm going to go down to the Jane strip and just shoot it up for no reason. And I'm stuff like that. Of Chicago. So I understand the whole idea about gun violence. I understand about that. When I first did the movie, uh, the public at the time always sent me on these gun rights shows. I don't know why, but <laughs> and they would ask me how I felt about guns. And I would tell them, you know, for me, although Chicago is portrayed very violent, the whole city's not violent as it try to make it out to be. But that's a whole other discussion by itself. But when I was growing up, there were only two people who had guns, bad people and the police. 
Now, I mean, everybody has guns now, but that's how it was. And when we were little kids and we heard shooting, this is not something kids shouldn't have to deal with. If we were outside playing, you we hear shooting, we had to determine how far away was it. If it was a couple of blocks away, you could still stay outside and play. But if it was really close, you got to duck. You need to go inside. House. That's not something that kids should have to know how to deal with that. You know, and they will always ask me how I felt about guns. And I would tell them, I said, if you're in a situation where somebody feels your life is threatened, there's no training that you can do that you can say, hey, when you feel this level, don't use the gun. But if you feel this level, use the gun. There's nothing. That's an individual thing. If I feel like I, my life is being in danger, I'm going to protect myself from whatever I have at my disposal. That You can't train that. There's no training class to train that. That's a very individual thing. It goes the same way with police overreacting. You know, they because there are people too, and they feel somebody is like endangering themselves. So they want to pull their gun out because they think the next move might be they go shoot them. So how do, the police are highly trained. So if you can't train the police to do it, how do you think you're going to train every regular everyday people to yeah. understand how to dre- address threat levels within your own internal self? Absolutely, I love that. I love it, and I cannot wait to watch the film. I think I'm going to check it out first. I'm still going to brag about it but I'm still going to let them check it out because I think that would be a great insight from, like I said, the others who are sitting across the table from us that don't really, we're exactly what you're saying. We're trying to explain that to them, but they're not understanding it at all. So I think the movie would, would help. So do you have any advice for people like myself? I do a lot. I rap, I act, I host, I do it all. Do you have any advice for people like myself who's trying to get into the industry? Like what are some of the pros and cons of, being in this entertainment industry? There is a phrase that I use uh, pretty much every day and that uh, I I tell people young and old, and it's that stay focused and be determined. That is something no matter where you are in your life, no matter what you're doing, we all need to stay focused and we all need to be determined. And the, the advice I could probably give to young people in this industry is that it's important that you really understand your purpose, what your strengths and your weaknesses are. And once you understand your strengths and weaknesses, then you need to play to your strengths and find people to collaborate who empower your weaknesses. A lot of times as a young person, you think you're Superman and you think that you can do everything, but you just can't. And it takes a lot of time to maturity to realize what your weaknesses are. You know, I am a, a, a pretty good producer, but I'm not the best uh, person when it comes to, although we're doing this, I'm not the best person who comes out and network and everything. I know a lot of people, but I, I can be a bit of a loner sometimes. So I have to push myself to actually interact with people. When I do, great things always happen. But by nature, I'm a person who tends to find solace within himself. So you have to really understand what your strengths and your weaknesses are. And once you really it's not so much as saying it, you have to really believe this is what your weakness is. People sometimes don't want to accept what their weaknesses are. They feel like we can fix it, but there's just some things that you can't, you just can't, you can't do, you know? Absolutely. So you That's- have to understand that and say, okay, who can I bring on my team to kind of help me empower that part? Absolutely. When it comes to movies, because I know you're, you do the film, you do all of that. What of what are some of your top five picks? If you had to pick top five films, not just your own, but others in general, what are the top five films and why is that number one? The one that you choose to be number one, why is that? Wow, number top three? five, top five, okay. Um, probably my all time favorite movie is uh, a movie called Yento. Yento is a uh, Barbara Streisand movie it was set like in 1904 in Eastern Europe. And it is about, it's a woman, it's about empower, a woman who wants to be empowered. During this time, women were not allowed to uh, read and learn the Torah or the Bible. And so her father would in secret show her and teach her. When he passed away, uh, the people in the village was basically like, you need to go get a husband or you need to get a family. And she's like, I don't want to do that. That's not the path for me. So she goes and runs away and she cuts her hair really short and uh, impersonates a boy. So she goes to uh, Bible school to, to teach, you know, learn the Bible. So she passes as a boy and she meets this guy 
who was really brilliant in, in understanding the Bible, she meets with him. Their, their banner is really great. And in the process of doing this, she falls in love with him. But she can't say anything because she's supposed to be a boy. He, in turn, wants to marry this woman who he adores. But the family wouldn't let him marry her because uh, her, they felt like his family had a curse because his brother committed suicide. So they didn't want to have that in their family. So he convinces uh, Yinto to marry the woman just so he can be by her side, just so he can be next to her. So Yinto marries her. <laughs> Weird. Obviously, they couldn't consummate the marriage because, you know, mm -hmm. but to make a long story short, what eventually happens is that he, Yinto tells what that she really woman and everything, and the family lets him marry the woman. And then she eventually goes to America to, to do what she really wanted to do. But what, what I like about the outside of that story, the empowerment about a woman really doing what she wanted to and all these odds and against her, what I like about that is their integration with music. Barbara Streisand directed this movie. This came out December the 9th, 1983. And at the time, I had just turned like 13. And so it was a point in my life where I was, you know, you still trying to figure out who you are and things of that sort. And, um, there's some music, there's a song in it where it's, it's called, Where Is It Written? Basically it's saying, where is it written to who you're supposed to be, what you can't do? It's not written anywhere. Sometimes we impose these self things on each other, what we can and cannot do, but there, it's written nowhere. Then she has this other song at the very end of the movie called A Piece of the Sky. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people are trying to get a piece of the sky and she says, why settle for a piece when you can have it all? There's enough out here for everybody. There's abundance. But for some reason, we have gotten our mind that it's only a little bit. We only can get this part. You can have it all there. So today in America, we, we, we just uh, got the first black woman Supreme Court justice. Oh, she like, was? Yeah, yeah. She, she got nominated. She got, you know, she's going to get confirmed, you know. And so you think about that when Barack Obama uh, was running for president. If you had to say like weeks, well, a year or two before, I would like, they're not gonna let no black man be the president. I just not gonna mm -hmm. be the president. What it did for me as an individual was that I don't want to be the president, but the possibility that I could be could be the president. Yeah, I could be the president now. Mm -hmm. So I know you asked me about the movie, but it's okay. <laughs> the second movie that I enjoy is uh, Malcolm X. Oh, I traditionally don't like long, super long movies, but I've never seen a movie to where there is no point in the story where it gets bored or just kind of get loose. Like, you know, like, okay, we got to get to this part. The whole story is great. The transformation of a black man from one place to where he ultimately got to, that's amazing. We don't really see, black men are usually betrayed in just one thing, either good or bad, but no transformation. It's almost like there's no redeeming for black men. So if you go down this path, you can't redeem yourself. You can't really go, any, go anywhere else. It's just like, that's who you are. But this man went from this one place to a totally different place that you could have not seen that. And, you know, as, as a young person, you can see where your life is going to be, to be, you know, such a strong leader and everything. So I always like that story because it shows how we as Black men can change and we can transform regardless of what they might say about us. Uh, a third movie, um, I would say, uh, Tyler Perry's um, uh, Family Reunion. Not so much the movie, but the stage play. Storyline? So I'm going to say this about Tyler Perry. I know people say a lot of crazy stuff about him and everything, but you know what? The thing about it is um, white folks do crazy, stupid stuff all the time. They do all the time. And we embrace it. The media embrace everything. It's okay. Why can't a black man do something silly and crazy and we embrace it too? It's all for entertainment. What difference does it make? So I, I respect his tenacity to keep going on in spite of what people made determination. Here's a guy who was living in his car, trying to do stage plays. Nobody, not even us, was really giving him the benefit of the doubt. He believed that this is something that could be, and he stayed on it. Eventually, he got, before he went to Hollywood, you have to think he was a millionaire before he went to Hollywood. People, I remember when, when Tyler Perry was doing stage plays. And I was dating this girl and her mother never went to the movie. She said the last time she went to go see the movie was super flat. It's the last time she had saw it. God movie. damn. So you have to think about this for a second. Tyler Perry's plays was like at least $40, $50 a piece. 
she was willing to spend that money to go see this black man at a stage play. Now, she never went to a Broadway play. She never went to an old Broadway play. No, she spent $40, $50 to see a stage play. So that tells you a lot about speaking. When I see a Tyler Perry movie, the one thing I love about it is the fact that all the cultural references are toward me as a black man. Yeah, absolutely. The music cues, when they say certain things, everybody knows when they do Earth, Wind, and Fire, do, 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 do. Everybody knows what to do. You know, that's no like, like, I like Seinfeld and I understand why they laughing, but it's kind of like, oh, it's not really for me. But when I look at Tyler Perry stuff. I know exactly why I'm laughing why they're laughing i know why they're doing these things and so it's very empowering to see that on television on the screen as a black man that somebody made something for me that Absolutely. i can connect with you know and you can relate to it too a lot of his stuff is very relatable like i have a lot of aunties like like medea and like like everybody has like a couple when you when i watch them i've watched everything i love medea whenever i watch them i feel like I, I can look and see, okay, that's my auntie. That's my uncle. Cause it's like, I feel like it's just the whole is watching it. It's just like, that's literally my family, but thank you, Medea. Some of the stuff I was trying to say is like, stop blaming. Let's, let's stop blaming them and let's take responsibility for our actions. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. We need to hear that. Cause clearly you understand what I mean? So yeah, I love Medea. So I think that's like my top three. I don't necessarily, I don't know if I have five, but those are like my top three movies that I like. So I have a question. How do people audition for like a film for one of your films? Do you get like referrals? Do you hold auditions? Like how would somebody get involved? So we do have a casting department. We do have a cast director we work with. Um, I will, you know, cast people based off of what, you know, what we're doing. I try to tell you all the time. People come to me all the time. You know, I want to audition or thing. But I have to be really honest. When it comes to audition, if we've written something that we that we wrote that we produced or for somebody else, I only can put people into situations that I have opportunities for them. So if I'm looking for a big black guy to be a football player, if you look like a skinny wrestler, I don't really have a part for you. <laughs> it's just it's a personal. I just don't have a part for you right now. So I'm not trying to like ignore you it's just that i don't have anything for you at this particular moment uh but if you go on uh the web page and click on casting it should have all the list of certain casting or who to send it to so if you go to londontownpictures.com l-o-n-d-y-n townpictures.com you should be able to see all the casting listing we have right now we're casting for uh, two films we we are doing uh about a month after we, uh, Ebony Hustle was released on uh, December the, uh, the 1st of last year. About a month later, the distributor came back and said, oh my God, it's doing really well. We need Ebony Hustle too. So we're right now uh, about to gear up to do uh, Ebony 2, which is going to come out sometime next year. And then there's another movie we're doing called uh, False Prophets. It's, um, it's about a woman who father owns a church and she does this Ponzi scheme to give money out of the community. You know, so it's a, uh, <laughs> it's a really deep dive into the church and people's just inner demons that they deal with. And, you know, uh, people just really concerned with, you know, how to get to where they want to do and not really concerned how other people are. Mm, Kevin, I need to audition for these things. Help me out. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was great meeting you. It was great sitting down talking to you. You're very informative. I love the work that you do. Like I said, I will be referring your film to um, to my team so that we could check that out um, as a group. I'll do it by myself, but as a group, I think it would be very informative and it would be something that will help us as well. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, I wish you all the best in your future endeavors and hopefully we can come back again. Hopefully the next time we speak, I'll be in Ebony Hustle Part 2 and we can have a discussion. I, I <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. It's uh, When I look at life in general, whenever somebody says yes to me, they probably said no to somebody else. So I'm very blessed when people want to collaborate and they want to talk to me because they don't have to. There's no requirement to talk. To Absolutely. Them. I'm always blessed when they want to do that, you know, and so I'm always looking to try to empower other people, you know, and that we try to find places that we can most elevate ourselves as a community, as Black community, and just people in general.
thank you so much. You have a beautiful blessed day. And hopefully, like I said, we can, um, when you're in the works of the other film, hopefully we'll be able to even, if it, if it will be cool um, to even um, interview some of your, 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 some of your stars that you have, some of your act uh, actors and actresses, that would be, I think that that would be really, really, really dope for us to just sit down and get an insight of it, especially leading up to part two and stuff like that. Um, I would love to do that as well. So whenever you're ready, if, if that, if we can make that possible, that would be amazing too. Yeah. We have some, some big names and I don't want to say them right now, but um, there's some people. Really Taraji? <laughs> I'm joking. I love her. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, if you hear me, Taraji, hey, let's talk, you know. But, I love Taraji. <laughs> uh, big names that um, I think that your audience will be, you know, very enamored by to want to have a discussion with. And I'm sure that they'll be willing to sit down and talk with you. So as we get closer, I will let you know. Uh, we're going to be shooting in Houston and in Atlanta. We're going to do this new show called Being Indie. And uh, it's going to be Being Indie. And it's going to be called, you know, Ebony Hustle Ballistic Protection. But it's going to be the whole process of us filmmaking up until we finish. We, 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 we will release like a couple of weeks before the movie comes out so, so everybody can see the process of what we went through. All the good, the bad, the ugly when it comes to filmmaking. Uh, but yeah, most definitely just, yeah, just connect with me. Let me know. We, I can make that happen. Okay. Well, thank you so much. You enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank and you. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey everyone watching Worldwide Entertainment TV. This is Ashley. Let us know your thoughts below and hit that notification bell after subscribing. Visit wwetvn.com.